Well, welcome everyone. You have joined Marion County Environmental Services today to host, who is hosting a webinar on food waste in Oregon. How bad is it and what can we do about it? Just wanna let you know that this is, meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube in the very near future and you will be given links to that so that you'll go back to watch it repeatedly. And I uh, would like to let you know that if you have a question that you would like to ask Elaine at the end, uh, you can send that question via chat and Rachel will be collecting them. And if, when we get to the end of Elaine's presentation, we will uh, take your questions and see what we can find out that uh, you, more you need to know about. Um, in the meantime, just to get started here, I'd like to introduce Elaine Blatt. She's a senior policy pro and program analyst for Oregon DEQ. And her focus primarily is on sustainable consumption and production of materials. And she helped lead the development of DEQ strategy for preventing the wasting of food. She's currently leading market research designed to inform development of values-based messaging to encourage Oregonians to reduce wasted food, representing Oregon in a West Coast initiative and developing outreach on to food waste businesses. In other words, she's finding all different angles to figure out how we can get that message out to reduce waste. Prior to joining DEQ, Elaine worked on a variety of projects related to sustainable production and consumption and energy efficiency and supply and chain management. She's got an MA in public policy from the University of Chicago and a BA in political science from Carleton College. Wow, you just don't run into folks like that every day. Elaine, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Alan. I'm happy to be here and, and uh, just wanna appreciate that, that you all are taking the time out today to learn a little bit about food waste and, and what DEQ is doing. Um, so here we are the week before Thanksgiving and, uh, and I thought I'd just ta start off by talking about the fact that really most of us, when we think about food, think about the bounty of food that we have, the way we enjoy it with our families and, um, and so on. Um, but what we don't think about so much is the reality associated with, um, with that bounty. And uh, I think in, in one of his earlier announcements for this webinar, Alan mentioned that 25% of the material in Marion County landfills is made up of food waste. Across the state of Oregon, it's about 16%, um, but that's a, a fairly significant um, wasted material. And we're gonna talk a bit more about that um, and about sort of in putting that, those numbers in context. So probably a, a number of you on the call have seen this data point um, that we think that 25 to 40% of all food that's grown or imported into the United States for human consumption is never eaten. Um, to, put, uh, to put some more detail onto that uh, number, that represents, that waste represents a huge loss of resources. And here are a couple of data points. If all that wasted food in the US were grown on one farm, that farm would probably be about the size of three quarters of the state of California. And in order to grow that food on that gigantic farm, we'd have to use all the water from Texas, California and Ohio combined. And then these two data points don't even begin to, to talk about the energy that goes into the equipment, fertilizer production use and pesticides that would grow that food on that mega farm. But now let's also just talk a bit, a bit about greenhouse gases associated with food production. I think that if when most people think about the greenhouse gas impact of food, what, they're, what they generally think about is the greenhouse gases that are generated in landfills. And that's an important issue. And you see that here on this graph. For every ton of food that's placed in a landfill, uh, about, a ton, about a half ton of CO2 equivalent is generated. And if we compost that food or if we, we put it through an anaerobic digester, we can eliminate those landfill impacts and we actually also gain a little benefit in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and that's all really good. Um, but if you look at the greenhouse gas reduction potential on the far right of this graph and see what that potential is if we reduced, if we prevented the wasting of food in the first place, you see that we have a potential that's six to seven times greater than, than simply managing food waste through composting or anaerobic digestion. Um, and we'll be talking, I'll be talking a bit more about why that is um, in a moment. 
Um, but you know, these are all big numbers and, and maybe, maybe food waste is not in fact that big a deal in the grand scheme of all of the materials that we waste. But I wanted to show you some data from Oregon's uh, uh, consumption-based emissions inventory. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this inventory, this is a, a, an inventory of all of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the materials that Oregonians consume, no matter where those materials were produced or where those emissions were in fact generated. And what we see from this graph is that um, food and beverages constitute the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Oregon after vehicles and parts. Um, so food waste is actually a pretty big deal. And the greenhouse gases that it generates are, are, are a very important part of our overall inventory. Um, but I also wanted to talk a bit about where those emissions are generated because we're talking about production and what you see on this graph, which is also consumption based emissions, the vast majority of those emissions are actually generated outside of our state. Um, and that's because even though we're an agricultural state, most of the food that we consume is actually imported from elsewhere. Um, but since global warming is a global problem, it frankly doesn't matter where greenhouse gases are generated, but it, if we're if we are uh, consuming products or not, in this case, not consuming products that generate those greenhouse gases, um, it's kind of a big deal. Now, probably most of you are familiar with Paul uh, Hawkins' work in Drawdown. Um, this is the work where he, he assembled a small army of, of scientists who studied a variety of, of interventions that we can use to, um, to prevent climate change. And those, uh, and those interventions focused on things that we can do right now that don't require any new technology or new discoveries. And he listed them in priority order, the top 100. And four food-based interventions made that list, but you might be surprised to see where they reside on that list. Food composting came in at number 60. Anaerobic digestion came in at number 30. Switching from uh, uh, a meat-based diet to a plant-rich diet came, comes in number four, but the top rated uh, intervention that we can engage in to reduce the greenhouse gases associated with food was food was reducing food waste that comes in at number three. Um, so, so we can see from Paul Hawkins' work, and that's uh, that that food that reducing food waste is really an important way that we can that we as individuals can reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and the reason for that is because of those production, uh, the, the production greenhouse gases that are associated with food. Um, and then for that reason, uh, DEQ focuses on this hierarchy when we think about our food po po policy. Um, and I think many of you have probably seen this before. It's based on EPA's food waste hierarchy where we focus first on source reduction and feeding hungry people and then um, moving down the hierarchy to composting and anaerobic digestion. Um, a problem for us right now is that even though we're highly focused on the top of the hierarchy, really the vast majority of attention is paid to those interventions at the bottom of the hierarchy. And so what we really want to do is um, encourage all of you to spend some time thinking about how we can reduce food waste in the first place. Now, some of you may be thinking that, um, how can we do, even do this? Because food waste is, is just inevitable, right? We all, and, and I'm as guilty as the next person. I, I, put, I throw my food waste into the compost bin here in Portland. We have curbside composting. Um, but I wanted to share this piece of data with you. And, and this is data from research that we did in the state of Oregon. We followed about 200 households and we literally asked them to keep track of the food they were wasting and why. And we learned a lot of things, but one of the things we learned is that of all of the food that, they, that these households were throwing out, only 30% was the stuff that we would all consider as inedible, shells, peels, bones, and so forth. But what we saw in this research is that a full 70% of the food that Oregonians are throwing out is food that could have been eaten if it had been better managed or if it hadn't been uh, leftovers that people got tired of or it hadn't gotten lost in the freezer and, 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 and been destroyed through the freezer burn. And so for us at DEQ, this is this, it's this 70% that, um, that we think is, um, is our big opportunity because we literally could reduce 70% of our food waste if, um, if we could uh, all focus on how we manage our food and ensure that we don't waste it. 
So now I'm going to turn to what the specific things that DEQ is doing and um, and all of the work that we do involves you all. So I'll be talking along the way about how you fit into the picture here with us at DEQ. And I'm gonna start first with household, with household programs. Um, Ellen mentioned in my, in my bio that I'm currently leading an effort to do some market research around uh, household uh, food waste reduction messaging. And I'm gonna spend a little time thinking about, talking about that with you today. Um, as many of you on this call know, because I know that many of you are out there actually doing this work, the bulk of the work that's been done in our state so far has been done at the local level. And, and you all are doing great work, um, really hard work, reaching out directly to individuals, but it's time consuming um, and, uh, so we, and, and resource intensive. And so we started to ask ourselves at DEQ, how might we um, augment this work with some additional statewide messaging that could help um, increase the scale of our interactions with folks on food waste. And about a year ago, we initiated this market research effort. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk a bit, a, a bit about that now um, and talk about what we've discovered. So here's a, an overview of the, of the messaging. It's, um, it's messaging intended to uh, identify the value-based messages that will, will motivate Oregonians to reduce their wasting of food. And uh, it's a combination of qualitative and quantitative research that we just wrapped up in it com completely in September. And we're moving into the development of the campaign, which I'll also be talking about a bit more. But um, what I first wanted to start out with in talking about the research is something that we learned when we did some social media baselining. Um, and this was worth knowing because uh, you have to know where you are <laughs> so that you know where you have to go. Uh, what you see here is a, a Google Trends that looks at the number of times various environmental issues were mentioned on social media, and it's graphed here for the last five years. Um, as you can see, recycling, which is the yellow line, is the, the most uh, popular topic. Um, there's a little bit of uh, popularity around climate change and there's a spike, and I'm not sure why there was a spike at that particular moment. But, um, but poor food waste is the, the blue line at the very bottom. And if you squint real hard, and I'm hoping you can see it on your screen, it's the teeny tiny blue line that's running along the axis at the bottom. Um, and so what that tells us is that even though um, I particularly, but a lot of other people I work with think that food waste is really important, it's not actually um, getting much attention in, in the general public. And what we also know from social media is that there's been very little change in the way that food waste has been addressed and the language that's been used to talk about it over the last 15 years. And that, uh, that this, uh, this little bit of online activity is really concentrated in a small group of people who are passionate about this topic. Um, another piece of our research involved uh, ethnographic diaries. We asked 43 Oregon households to um, answer some questions over about a three week period. And I just wanna share with you some of the top line uh, results from, the, from those diaries. Um, first, what we learned from our diary participants is that we need to stop talking about how big a problem food waste is. And I realized I just did that. I told you how big a problem it is. Um, but when we talk to the general public about how big a problem it is, it reinforces a per the perception that, that food waste is unavoidable and that we, there's nothing we can do about it. And it undermines um, agency. Um, we also need to get away from, a, from any tendency we may have to make people feel guilty about their food waste. Uh, we found out from our diary participants that they hate waste they, and they hate waste and they hate people who are wasteful. Um, and when people feel that way about a topic, then they certainly don't want to be in that group of people that they find um, inferior. And so, so people will find ways to let themselves off the hook um, if they, it, in order to just not consider themselves to be wasters. Um, and then finally, and this was, was uh, tragic <laughs> for us at DEQ, we discovered that some of our diary participants actually believed that food waste wasn't really a problem because it degrades. So the very thing about food waste that makes it a problem is a thing that, that people in the general public think uh, makes it not a problem. So we then um, moved on to, to do a couple of focus groups but back in February. One group was made up of households with children, one group made up with, of households with no children, and the, the representatives in the group came from across the state. Um, so I wanna talk just quickly about some of the, the top line findings from those focus groups. We showed them a number of creative images and I'm just gonna share uh, three of them. Um, 
these two did extremely well with focus groups. Um, we had a lot of people in the focus groups who found the, the humorous bad Apple messaging um, quite engaging and people uh, uh, responded as they often do um, to people directly in the supply chain. And so those, those uh, images uh, tested well in focus groups. We also wanted to test the idea that we could educate consumers about food waste and its relative um, impacts to other impacts that people uh, care about. And so we, we created this image um, that tried to explain to people that, that the food in your plastic bag is, is, a, could, is potentially a greater contributor to environmental impacts than the bag itself. Um, but we learned from our focus groups that that environmental message did not play well. And in fact, among the five images that we put in front of people, that image was, was the poorest performer. So again, um, because we're DEQ, um, that, was, that was kind of a, a tragic thing for us to think about. Um, so now I'm gonna turn to what is the, the real central piece of this market research, and that's the, uh, the statewide survey that we conducted in August. Um, after hitting a pause on all this work in April when COVID hit, we decided at that point that it was a poor time to be talking to people about food waste, but by, by August, we, de we determined that we could probably go ahead. Um, and so I'm gonna, and there's just a load of data that came out of this survey. And, and today I'm only gonna be able to touch on the very kind of top line um, results, but would be happy to talk with any of you further later if you wanted to dig into these results in more detail. But um, so here's one of the first pieces of, of uh, uh, data that we got, and it's an encouraging one. Um, we uh, learned from people responding to our survey that um, more than three quarters of people across a range of demographics thought, thought that reducing food waste was an important topic. Um, and um, also interesting, since we postponed this survey until August, we were able to ask people about their attitudes about food waste and, and whether or not they thought they had changed because of COVID. And we learned that half of our respondents um, thought that reducing food waste was probably more important to them now um, than it was before the pandemic. So it's possible that we are actually in a moment where uh, we can, can really engage people because they're more interested in this topic than they were before. Um, but at the same time, and there's always a but after uh, news like this, it was also the case that um, despite thinking that food waste was, an, was important, um, people who responded um, also had just had this overriding sense that it was inevitable. And, and in fact, nearly half of people across demographics um, found that, um, that food waste was inevitable. Even among Oregonians who thought that it was, that food waste was extremely important, 45% still thought that it was going to be, and, or a third of them thought that it was gonna, that food waste was inevitable. And, and even 45% um, among others um, who, who thought it was somewhat less important um, thought that it was inevitable. So, um, so, that's, so that's part of the challenge we have going forward. But I'm going to move on to some other more important, more positive findings, and here's what's really what we found really encouraging about sur the survey uh, results. Um, among the things we asked survey participants about was was we asked them to tell us whether or not they were already doing things to reduce um, food waste, and then we cross tabulated those answers with responses to the question about the importance of wasting food that I just discussed. And what we found is that 31% of people said they were doing a lot. Um, and that and and, uh, and that they thought it was extremely important. And 19% said that uh, they didn't think food waste was important and not surprisingly, they weren't doing very much. But what we found really important for the purposes of going forward with a campaign is that 50% of people who've responded to the survey um, were doing, you know, expressed that they were doing a few things, but they still had, a number of things they could be doing, but they also believe that they could that they could do more. And so it's that 50%, that 50% is, is essentially our target audience of persuadables. And so that's pretty good. That gives us a lot of opportunity to, um, to reduce food waste if we can just get activate the, the, that 50%. So how can we do that? Uh, let's turn to uh, some results about the, uh, the kinds of messaging that might most motivate people. Uh, to reduce their food waste. And we tested a series of messages and you see some of them uh, listed here. And what we learned is that throwing away food is a waste of money 
was a very strong motivator. And if you remember what people told us in the ethnographic diaries about how much they hate waste, um, you'll, you, um, you will see that there's this, this sort of confirms that um, a huge number of people um, either agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. Um, and, then, and then if you go down through the other more middling uh, uh, performers, the, those uh, are about uh, food rescue and the resources that go into producing food. But again, um, and because I work for DEQ, this was also somewhat dismaying. The two poorest performing messages were the ones that focused on the environmental impacts associated with wasting food. Um, so what this told us is that, that what we really need to do is start shifting our thinking away from talking about environmental impacts and, and to talking to people about the thing that seems to matter most to them, which is the, the waste of money that's associated with wasting of food. And, and importantly, if you look at the numbers in the columns on the right, um, you see that this message also performs well among those folks who didn't agree so strongly or even disagreed that food waste was, um, was a fact of life and unavoidable. And um, so we think that that's gonna help us reach more people. Through in the pr process of doing the survey, we also uh, put uh, these three creative images in front of recipient re respondents. Um, the way this testing was done was monadically, which means that the survey, the total survey group was divided into thirds and each third saw only one image. So they responded to questions about that specific image and there were no comparative questions. Um, and I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about the performance of these three images. Again, you see bad apple, which you saw before. Um, then we have farmer, which is about those folks who are involved in the food supply chain. And then the third one that we tested was a, a, a campaign we called Magnet, which focuses on the simple, small, simple steps that uh, folks can take. So when we put these images in front of people, we ask them a variety of questions. And, and this slide packs a ton of information into, the, into, uh, into it about the, the performance of these ads. Um, and so um, I'm gonna, and I, oh, I also wanna emphasize that the, the, the data that I'm presenting here are the data from that target group, that 50% of persuadables. So what you can see here is that Bad Apple does really well um, as an image on credibility, on providing new information, um, and on influencing people to take new steps. Uh, people found it personal and that, and, and it linked very strongly, obviously, to the notion of saving money by reducing your food waste, which was the best performing message. Um, farmer also did well. Um, human subjects always strike an emotional chord with people, and this ad conveyed well the human costs of wasted food. Um, Magnet, unfortunately, just didn't, pro didn't perform so well. But what I really want you to key in on is the, the data at the bottom of this slide. Before showing people these images, we actually asked them about their beliefs that they could make, a, that their personal actions could make a big difference. And then we showed them the ads and had them take a look at it and read the material that was, the written material that was on the ad. And then we asked them again to tell us if they believe their personal actions could make a difference. And what you see in these data at the bottom are that, that uh, among the people who looked at Bad Apple, the, the number of people, the percentage of, of folks who thought they could, could make a big difference rose from 83 to 89. And among farmers, the number, the percentage of people who thought that they, their actions could make a big difference rose a lot from 79 to 87. Um, but again, um, in the magnet, um, didn't perform so well. And in fact, after viewing the small civil steps that they could do to, to reduce their food waste, somehow um, people were less motivated to, um, to take action to reduce their food waste. And then um, I'm just gonna quickly give you one last piece of, of data about the performance of these ads. Um, we asked folks to just uh, respond to, to a variety of words and ask, how, and ask them how well those words described the ads they were looking at. And what you see again here is that Bad Apple performs very well um, on the positive uh, uh, words and, and also um, doesn't seem to generate much negative opinion. Um, Farmer also performed pretty well. It generated a little negativity around, uh, and around people who thought that it was perhaps boring and not particularly relevant. And then um, like uh, for other data points, Magnet performs poorly. Uh, I want to point out that one of the places that Bad Apple performed particularly well was as a memorable image. 
and in a world where we're all just bombarded with constant um, uh, you know, ads and social media and so forth, having um, a, a, an image that's memorable is pretty important to us. So moving forward, now that we've completed this research, our, our contractors are busy working on developing a messaging architecture that will then be used to develop the campaign itself. So the, the filled, filled out creative and the collateral and the, the, the uh, and a, a strategy for deploying that collateral that we'll be implementing next year. Um, and this is where you all come in. Um, we do want to get at this stage some of this material in front of, of those of you who we think are likely to use it. Um, in addition to having a statewide campaign, this collateral will include things that will include collateral that's that's uh, intended for use at the local level, either by governments or by NGOs. So um, if you are interested in participating in some uh, some meetings around um, getting feedback on some of that collateral, or if you want to um, see it and provide uh, uh, feedback outside of those kinds of meetings, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, now I want to turn to commercial food service work that we're doing. And I know that there are um, some folks on the call who, who just received uh, grants from Marion County. And uh, so first of all, congratulations. That's really great. And I'm glad you're here on this uh, call today. Uh, so we're, DEQ continues to do a variety of work with commercial food service, and we wanna ramp up that work in 2021. Um, we have a, a very strong partnership with the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association, and some of you may know that uh, we have done, um, pre-COVID, we did live workshops with restaurants uh, when we could get people in a room, um, and those, those workshops were pretty well received. Um, but now with COVID and the pressure that's being placed on food service businesses and so forth, we're working with Orla to try to, to pivot to developing other tools that are better tailored to this time and to the, what we think will be the, an ongoing um, challenge in the post COVID world as uh, food service organizations are trying to get back up and running. So going forward, we will very likely do far fewer live workshops like the one you see in this picture and really focus more on online materials, short training videos that are brief, easy to digest pieces and so forth. And um, we plan to roll out some of that material in the coming few months. Um, so you can look for that on the, the website Foodway Stops With Me that you see here. Um, some of you, I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with the uh, food waste campaign, Wasted Food, Wasted Money that DEQ developed originally um, to assist local governments in complying with the food waste prevention and reuse requirements that they needed to implement. We um, have plans to revisit this material and refresh it and revise it in early 2021. Um, so you can look forward to seeing these materials on our website um, and a refresh and a re rethinking of some of this material. Um, these materials um, provide uh, tips about how you can reduce food waste in your food service business. Um, we also have these resource guides that provide links to a variety of places you can go to get more information about how to reduce food waste in your business. And um, importantly, these materials are available not just in English, but they're also available in Spanish, Russian, and Vietnamese. Um, in addition to these actual pieces of collateral, we also have resources that you can tap into that include a slide library if you're a local government or NGO working with these materials, um, sample press releases and social media content that you could use to, um, to, to uh, uh, implement your own campaign. And then finally, um, there we, Oregon, the state of Oregon is involved in something called the West Coast Voluntary Initiative to Reduce Wasted Food. This is part of, of a larger organization called the Pacific Coast Collaborative that's made up of California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and the largest cities in those jurisdictions. And one of the, the big uh, projects that the PCC is engaged in is um, a project to work with grocers and brand manufacturers on an institutional and systemic basis to reduce their wasted food. We've already recruited a number of grocery chains that include Kroger, the parent company of Fred Meyer, um, Albertson Safeway, New Seasons, um, and we are moving into implementation now and into next year. Um, the first place that we'll be working with these grocery chains is on dairy waste and produce waste. And uh, some of that work may have spillover impact on consumers because in the process of looking at systemic waste with grocers, we also wanna look at the kinds of 
things that are happening with food marketing and merchandising that cause consumers to waste more food. So um, we're, I'm looking forward to, to, to some real um, uh, 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 results to report out of this project early next year. And then finally, I'm just gonna wrap up um, because um, you know, we're all living through, through COVID and, um, and, and DEQ, as I mentioned, we paused some of our work back in April because on account of COVID. Um, but we also asked ourselves if there was something that we could do directly um, during this time that around preventing the wasting of food. And one of the first things we thought about was we knew even in April because of, on account of our research, um, that we learned some important things about messaging and that some of that, those important things could be used to talk to people about how to manage food during the COVID period. Uh, you know, we appreciated the fact that, that shopping had become an anxiety ridden experience for some people um, and that people were, were perhaps going to the grocery store less frequently um, than before. And so they were buying more food and having to, to manage more food at home. And what we realized is that is that all of the things that we tell people about how they can reduce their food waste, all the small, simple steps about managing food and, tra and keeping track of it in your fridge and storing it properly and so forth and planning trips to the grocery store could help alleviate the anxiety that people were having around food generally and might in fact help them reduce their waste. Um, and at the same time, we also wanted to recognize the folks in the supply chain because we had learned from our focus groups that this human connection with people in the supply chain was super important. So we created this campaign, Getting Your Food to Go the Distance During COVID, that focused um, primarily on telling stories of real Oregon businesses. And you see them here, some of them here on this slide, um, and, and the ways that these businesses were were um, making a go of it and, and continuing to provide support to their communities during COVID. Um, and then connect our actions as individuals reducing food waste with helping these people continue to do their jobs during this risky time. Um, so we're pretty, we would have been pretty excited about this campaign and you can find uh, the, these images and, and more on, our, on DEQ's website. And then finally, one last thing before I wrap up, um, like um, all of you, uh, we at DEQ saw images of farmers and food processors and manufacturers literally dumping food that they couldn't sell um, because the food service industry had, had either slowed or shut down. And we asked ourselves what we could do about that. And one of the things that we learned from our partnership with the Oregon Food Bank is uh, that it, that they had that they could take this food um, and in the past had taken food um, excess food from farmers and, and processors um, but um, but that food was often the tr the cost of transporting that food was often donated by processors and also that food needed to be repackaged so that it could be distributed to the Oregon Food Bank's client population. And so, the, so Oregon DEQ decided to step in with a $140,000 grant to the Oregon Food Bank. That grant will cover the cost of transporting and already is covering the cost of transporting and repackaging more than 2 million pounds of fresh produce from growers and processors in the Pacific Northwest and in Northern California. And that's going to end up um, delivering the equivalent of nearly 1.7 million meals to Oregonians who are currently experiencing food insecurity. So it was, a, it was great for us to be able to feel like we could help feed hungry Oregonians during this time and also um, uh, reduce food waste, which is, which is our primary mission. And so thank you all for, um, for uh, listening to me this morning and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, boy, uh, Elaine, thank you so much. That was an amazing. Um, as somebody said, there's uh, it's it's uh, digestible information, um, with a pun intended, I believe. <laughs> but, but I just want to let you know that you you threw out so many ideas there, and um, I'm excited about the fact that uh, personally, because here you know work through Marion County, we we love it to be able to get uh, spoon fed some some you know, great graphics and great information that we can help pass on to the, to the public, uh, especially the stuff that's already been tested, it resonates better. I absolutely was one of those that felt like they, uh, when I saw those three images of the, of the, 
of advertisement. I did not go with the with the Apple one. Uh, <laughs> with the farmer, I figured the farmer was a winner, um, but uh, it's uh, goes to show you what I know. But anyway, um, got some questions here, and I want to um, bring on uh, a, Rachel, who's been taking a look at the questions. So she'll bring those up to you, and let's let's discuss those. Rachel, okay. you there? Can you hear me, Ellen? Yeah. Perfect. Um, I think I'm going to address the first kind of question that's popped up a few times throughout the chat, and that would be um, if folks want to have a copy of the slides from this presentation, will they be available? I'll start there. Well, but um, we could do, um, if you're okay with that, Elaine, we could do the, I've uh, got those um, PDFs. Or also this, for those of you who came in later, the, this uh, whole presentation is gonna be put on YouTube and I will be sending out the links uh, as soon as I get it posted on YouTube. So you'll be able to go there and see it and, and also to share it with, with those that you would like to share with. Yeah, and Ellen, I'm, I'm perfectly happy um, if people wanna take it, uh, get the slides too. So, so whatever format works best for them is okay with us. Perfect, okay, excellent. What else you got there, Rachel? All right, I'm gonna start at the top of the list and work our way down. Um, this question had been from Mel and I know that it, it was covered a little bit back. I just wanted to see if there was any additional information, Aline, that you could share um, about how the data was collected um, and you know the data including peels, cobs, non-edibles, um, maybe a little bit more about um, the data collection itself, if you had any additional to add. The data, I, I, I'm assuming that the, because the question references peels and cobs and things mm -hmm. like that, was, is talking about how we collected data on the actual um, food that's wasted in Oregon households. Um, and that was, and um, it's a good question. Uh, we, uh, so I mentioned that we engaged 200 Oregon households in a, in a uh, process. And what we asked them to do is keep diaries over a two week period. And we gave them scales and we gave and we asked them to went to weigh their food and take pictures of it and um, and then record in a diary um, why they were throwing this food out and, and you know a little description of what it was and so forth. Um, and so that was the primary way that we were able to figure out what people were throwing out and whether or not it could have been eaten. Um, and, but we also sent out a um, small army of uh, Portland State graduate students who uh, did um, who, who actually looked in the waste bins of our participating households to verify the, the information. And um, not surprisingly, the households underestimated their waste a little bit relative to what our students found, but it was actually pretty close. And so it was actually literally looking at, at real uh, waste that allowed us to, to, to uh, conclude that 70% of the food that was being thrown away is food that could have been eaten. Thank you. That that was great. I, I, um, because Marion County were working on doing food waste audits, um, I really did love. I've heard you talk about that before. The students, um, kind of doing those mini food audits, <laughs> of people's trash, and that's great. And um, they're just fun. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> Uh, I'll be, uh, after the pause, we will be gearing up to do some of our own for our grant winners. Um, our next question comes from uh, my one of my favorite former co-workers, Mr. Bailey Peen. And this is about um, income demographics. And he was wondering, um, do wealthier areas create more food waste as they do with recycling? That is a super good question, Bailey. <laughs> um, so, um, in the in the the diary, so the the the, the study that, that produced that seventy percent number, um, we didn't actually find any strong correlation between the amount of food wasted and um, income. Now, the, the my major caveat for that uh, statement is that we only had two hundred households, and so. Um, uh, the, our sample was not did not produce representative results, and so I can't say with 100% certain, certainty. Um, but that was a finding that sort of surprised us. I have seen other uh, research that suggests that wealthier people um, 
do waste more food. They definitely waste different food. So, so in the, they waste more fresh produce and, and, and stuff like that. Um, we, in, the, in, this, in this messaging research, we found very little difference among how people responded to our messaging based on income um, and, uh, and, and think that the, the messaging around saving money is something that, that resonates with everybody. It can obviously resonate with people who um, have tighter budgets, um, but, um, but at the same time, it resonates well among people who are not, um, who have higher incomes. Thank you. And our next question is from Bobby McAllister. Um, what is the state of Oregon doing to facilitate transition to a plant-based diet? For instance, pivoting food bank, school lunch programs, and the food subsidy program to encourage, reward, incentivize sustainable plant-based foods. So that is, um, I'm, hopefully these are all great questions. Um, so I, I will have to confess at the moment, uh, DEQ has not focused its attention on diet um, in any um, large scale way, although we've been talking about it. Um, may, par, the, the primary way that we've been addressing uh, uh, shifts to a plant-based diet is to provide information to Oregon residents about the relative impacts of foods and to allow them to make their own choices as they move forward to, um, to uh, sh shift to a more plant-based diet if that fits their lifestyle. Thank you. Um, and then I honestly, I think you could take us there quicker, Aline. Um, on the DEQ's homepage, and this is from Tracy Fox, um, <laughs> where does one go to find um, all of this food information? Ah, so the DEQ website, <laughs> and then now I'm forced to make true confessions, the DEQ website is extremely difficult to navigate. Um, <laughs> And um, I think in the, in the embedded in this, in this slide deck are some URLs. Um, and the best way to, to reach some of this material is to just go back to those URLs in the, in the slide deck. Um, if you wanted to explore what we're doing with food uh, more broadly, um, the thing to do is get on DEQ's website and then find the materials management program. And once you get to the materials management website, you'll see um, some links to, uh, to our wide variety of food work, not just um, uh, reducing food waste. We also have a lot of information out on our website about, about the impacts of different foods, um, the impacts of transportation and packaging and, and a bunch of interesting stuff and food serviceware um, that you might wanna explore. Um, if you're looking for something in particular and you can't find it, um, I am more than happy to answer emails and to, to provide you with direct links so that you can avoid the frustration of having to hunt them down on DEQ's website. So Elaine, I can also, I'll, I'll do this. And someone who sent out a link to everybody that signed up for this webinar, uh, I, I can include some of those links as well. Um, and, I, and I feel your pain. It's always difficult as a government agency to, <laughs> to, to figure out when we, we, all of us have such diverse programs and uh, it's it's hard to navigate uh, yeah. whether you talk about DEQ or Marion County for that matter. So, um, but uh, I, I thank you for offering all that information up. Do we have anything else there? We um, have a April? few more. Um, okay. So another great question from Mel, um, what metrics will be used for determining the success of the marketing and outreach? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so we do, um, we do have plans to, to measure um, the penetration of, of the messaging. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. And, and um, Mel, if, if you know something about marketing and, and, and so forth, which it sounds like maybe you do, um, it's, it's, well, it, it will require us to get some more information out into the field, um, another survey perhaps uh, somewhere down the line where we can ask people if they've seen this messaging. There are other things that we can do that are less resource intensive between now and then, which is basically looking at whether or not um, campaign, we're getting the kind of earned media, for example, that we're looking for. Um, we're gonna be exploring channels um, where, where there will be an opportunity to measure how things are performing in those channels. Um, for example, um, we're really interested in the possibility of putting some of this material out directly in grocery stores. One of the things I didn't talk about in my, sli in my slide deck was that we did ask people about the information channels they thought they would most like to, 
to see food waste reduction messaging in and and uh, sort of point of uh, sale uh, information at, at supermarkets was a was a big winner. Um, we're also exploring the possibility when we finally get past COVID and people go back to um, to their more normal lives of using of doing food waste reduction messaging at large event venues like like sports stadiums and so forth where people are are hanging out and eating and and uh, and and we can can talk about about sustainability of that stadium and reducing reducing food waste and in those um, contexts we can start to measure whether or not people are seeing the images and and perhaps quickly survey whether or not anything is staying with them as they leave an event. So those are the kinds of, of things we're exploring about how we'll, we'll measure whether or not our messaging is getting through. It'll be exciting to see all that uh, research come out. I'm, I'm excited to see that. Um, and then we have another one um, from Monica and she would say, um, she'd like to know more about um, targeting children's students with this message and schools. And um, in parentheses, I'm guessing for an example around school lunch programs. Wow, um, also a really good question. Um, so our objective when we did this market research was to um, develop a campaign that would be targeted at households generally. So we didn't really ask ourselves or, or ask questions about messaging that might um, be most effective with children um, or, or even uh, or in, and in the context of school lunch programs. Um, so that wasn't part of the, the research. I will say that we're very interested um, as, as a, in general in, um, in engaging kids, school kids in questions around and in the issues around food waste um, because it's also, it's a marketing truism um, and a behavior change truism that if you get people engaged when they're young, um, they're more likely to have a lifetime habit. And in our case, it would be an, a positive lifetime habit for uh, around reducing food waste as opposed to something that might be viewed as more negative um, like brand identification and so forth. But that's, it's essentially using that same science uh, to engage kids. And so, so one of the things we'll be looking at going forward with our food waste work in DEQ is how we can better engage schools. And so right now, those are the last of the questions on, oh, here we go, new one just popped up. Um, if people, this is from Hans, if people do more mini shopping, so I'm, I'm guessing maybe you're right, right now around COVID um, or post COVID, I would guess there would be more automobile trips to the store, somewhat offsetting the positive benefits. So um, that's actually a really interesting one. We've have had that discussion with folks um, about that kind of offset of how far you have to go to shop. Um, do you have any data around that, Elaine, around people <laughs> versus uh, the carbon offset of driving? Uh, so those are all, that's an, an, another excellent question. Um, so I can't speak, we don't, um, in terms of, of whether or not, um, what and what kind of impact the COVID experience is having on, on people's trips to the grocery store, we don't actually have data. Um, we suspect that um, that people are probably making fewer trips to the grocery store right now on account of COVID because um, it's ju it's just it's something that grocery shopping is something that people are trying to avoid. At the same time, we also know that it's likely that, or we also think it's likely that people may be using more delivery services, and therefore um, you know generating uh, carbon impacts from the people who are delivering their food. Um, we have not specifically studied those kinds of impacts at DEQ. Um, I can tell you that, that if I think about this and, and extrapolate from work that we've done on food rescue, we know that um, food rescue that involves making multiple shorter trips with less food um, generate often generate um, carbon impacts that actually exceed the benefit of rescuing that food. Um, so I think there's more to be unpacked um, on that question. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I just don't have the specific answer. Thank you. And Rachel. Are we doing any more, Rachel? I do not have any more listed. So okay. I don't know if anyone has a last one to get in before we end or. 
And again, I'd like to, while we're waiting for that last bit, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Again, this is Marion County Environmental Services. You've been listening to a webinar about food waste with Elaine Blatt from DEQ. You will be getting these materials, you'll be getting slides and links and information, probably more than you ever wanted um, <laughs> from me in the near future. And I just want you to know, Elaine, everybody in the chat box, I think here is saying what a great presentation. So again, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, thank you all for, for listening to me. And, and, um, and I was very, very uh, sincere when I said, we are, are very anxious to engage all of you who are doing this work on the ground um, and helping us as we move forward with the messaging, as we move forward with the, with the, re, uh, uh, the refresh on our commercial campaigns and so forth. So if you've got an interest, um, just let me know <laughs> because we could really use your help. Um, thanks so much, Lane. And with that, um, I will bid everyone adieu and uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. I'll be in touch. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. And I'll, uh, um, if you think of some links that are, uh, that I need to, that I might not find, just send them to me. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just kind of shoot through there. It is a little yeah. tricky finding stuff on the, on the DEQ side. It's, it's very difficult. So yeah, I'll, um, I'll buzz back through um, the, the slides and just make sure that all the links that people might be interested in are embedded there. And if they're not, I'll send them, I'll send more to you. Okay, super. Yeah. Okay. Great. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. And the, the questions were astonishingly great. It was, uh, yeah. they're really good people on the call. Yeah, that was a good call. Okay, well, I realize that uh, I think we're still recording, so. <laughs>